Good evening, and I, I really am pleased to be back and to continue this lecture series. I was uh, uh, interested in the experience of having a talkback session this afternoon uh, when I understood from Dr. McRae what the uh, sessions might entail. Uh, I began to wonder whether there would be any time to breathe in between one activity after another because certainly uh, the, the program that the Hayward Lectures uh, need to, to maintain and, and all of the other things that are going on at the same time uh, fill one's days, but I, I enjoyed it very much and I look forward to that uh, continuing. As Oliver has just said, my topic tonight is contemporary concepts of knowledge in post-secondary education, the role of the church. Uh, last evening in the first of this series, on, on that theme, I began by describing the changing nature of post-secondary education in Canada now, with special emphasis on the changes associated with the development of a greatly expanded post-secondary system of education in almost all of the provinces, the introduction of several new church-related degree-granting institutions, and the vastly increased demand on the part of Canadians from every walk of life for access to post-secondary education. After discussing some of the expectations and some of the criticisms currently being voiced about the role of post-secondary education in Canada, I concluded by arguing that the church has and must continue to have a role in post-secondary education. If the Christian church today is to fulfill its mission of informing people everywhere and in every age about the love of God and as he has revealed it by his spirit, through his son and in his word, then it follows that the church must learn how to communicate that message in ways that can be understood and make sense to the people being addressed. To fulfill that mission properly in the realm of post-secondary education, we must, I believe, address the question of knowledge and what counts for knowledge. Learning to communicate in another language was a primary lesson provided for the first disciples once they began to fulfill the commission given to them by their master when he left them. And as we know, that commission found in the last chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew and the early part of the book of Acts. Learning to speak in ways that make sense to people in their own culture and to people in other cultures were early lessons for the church to master as well. And we have the story, a familiar one, of Peter and Cornelius, the story of Paul moving in to uh, greet people and learn to meet people like Lydia, the, Paul's call to share God's message and love and grace uh, through uh, the church in every place that he visited. So in a very real sense, those lessons learned in the earliest days of the Christian church are the same ones we must learn over and over again. To be able to understand what is being said, we must know what words mean to the listeners. And we must realize that the same words may have different meanings and will be understood differently in various contexts by various listeners. Someone's put it this way, a new language always reflects a new point of view. The gradual, unconscious popularization of new words or of old words used in new ways is a sure sign of a profound change in people's articulation of the world. The Christian church is intended to change the ways we think about ourselves, about others, about our world, about our destiny and our relation to God. The Word of God brings the most profound changes possible in our ways of thinking because it has its source outside of ordinary human experience. It can transform basic human premises and can provide a new starting point for every thought and action. The Christian Church is charged with a responsibility for articulating these premises and is given the capacity to do so. I will contend that the Church is responsible for providing explanation in the realms of scholarship, research, and teaching in post-secondary education as well as in education generally, just as it is responsible for demonstrating the reality and meaning of God.
God's word in every realm of human behavior and endeavor. Nothing is more basic to this task than our vision of God and our understanding of the way he views humankind. Such a vision is more than a hope or even a prophecy. It is the kind of vision that brings a sense of causation. Because of that vision, our way of looking at things, the way we see that certain consequences will result from certain events and actions, and the vision we hold can thus be said to cause us to think and to act accordingly. I hope to be able to elaborate on that as we go along because it's a very powerful effect and it's one that we either don't think about or we simply take for granted. How then can the church best communicate a message that speaks a different language so that it can be understood properly by the modern mind? Clearly, it requires the work of Christian scholars who can address this task and teach others to undertake the task also. The Christian church in our day must be conscious of the context that frames our own understanding of what we take to be true and must be aware of the various contexts that frame human understandings in all the spheres of knowledge we currently recognize, certainly in post-secondary education. I propose to address this question first by reviewing some contemporary concepts of knowledge and then by going on to a consideration of the influence of persons as knowers on the process of discovery and establishing what is said to be known and on what counts for knowledge. I will conclude by describing the role I see for scholars whose presuppositions are consistent with their Christian faith and who represent the church directly or indirectly in post-secondary education. To understand contemporary concepts of knowledge is by tradition the task of the philosopher. I do not pretend to that role. But I will argue that it is the task of the church and of all those concerned about post-secondary education to have some understanding of what constitutes knowledge in our time. In selecting the curriculum for post-secondary education, we must ask such questions as, what is knowledge? What knowledge is most reliable and important? How does knowledge arrive? And how ought the search for knowledge be conducted? The task of defining knowledge and of deciding what knowledge is of most worth become the focal points for ongoing lively debate in institutions of post-secondary education everywhere. And I invite you to observe any one of our Senate meetings at any time when we're discussing curriculum to know that that, that does happen. The study of epistemology is helpful to our understanding because it is concerned with the theory of knowledge, its nature, its scope, and its sources. Epistemology deals analytically with the relation of knowledge to such notions as sensation, perception, memory, imagination, belief, and judgment. It suggests ways to distinguish among several modes of knowing and classifies knowledge according to the various ways people over time have organized and structured experiences so that we are able to make sense of them. What counts for knowledge in institutions of post-secondary education today is recognized, or is supposed to be recognized, only after concepts have been tested against publicly held criteria and have been shared with others. Each form of knowledge, such as history or mathematics, has its own particular concepts which have been tested according to agreed upon rules within the discipline for classifying and categorizing experience and thought and are then accepted by the collegium of historians or the collegium of mathematicians, as the case may be, as valid knowledge in that discipline. Moreover, there are three conditions that must be met before scholars achieve such knowledge. The first is the condition of belief. In this context, belief does not imply truth but rather a mental concept, an idea, a tentative hypothesis about what might be the case. In order to strengthen the case, a second condition must be met. The claim for knowledge must be justified on the basis of compelling evidence <coughs> presented according to accepted disciplined standards. However, such justification in itself is not sufficient unless the third condition obtains also 
the condition of truth. The claim for truth is not merely a matter of agreement among friends, but is a matter of testing against what is the case about the world, about God, about a work of art, about a moral action, and so on. Thus, ways of knowing vary according to people's beliefs and perceptions about the nature of things, and conversely, what people believe about reality depends on what they count for knowledge. A whole range of answers to the question of what knowledge and what is knowledge may be expected from scholars who are identified with different sets of beliefs and perceptions, with specialized ways of thinking, and with various ways of viewing the world, whether they be logical positivists, phenomenologists, existentialists, or Christians, to name a few possibilities. In institutions of post-secondary education, we acknowledge distinctions among ways of knowing by organizing scholarly research and teaching according to the special skills and ways of thinking that have come to be associated with each discipline or field of study. According to the Encyclopedia of Education published a few years ago, there have been 35, approximately 35, general schemes proposed for classifying kinds of knowledge since Plato. Each classification scheme takes as a premise that distinctively different kinds of knowledge are attainable. Some of the schemes have been designed to ensure that bridges will be formed between these islands of specialized knowledge. Many are intended to assist in determining the gaps in knowledge that remain and ought to be addressed. And from time to time, in a popular way, we hear about those gaps, particularly from the physicists and the astronomers. It seems to me the physicists are always finding smaller and smaller particles of matter and energy, and the astronomers are finding more and more black holes or, or whatever um, in, in their uh, scanning of the universe. For this evening's lecture, however, I've selected three different types of classifications of knowledge as examples of the ways we human beings manipulate our ideas. Each scheme has its proponents, and of course it has its critics. None, none, no scheme is entirely satisfactory, and when revolutionary new ways of viewing reality within fields of study are suddenly adopted by a majority of scholars, as in what has come to be called a paradigmatic shift, changes in these schemes of things are made in comparatively short order. The first classification I will describe is based on modes of knowledge and experience. The second cuts across different fields of knowledge by regrouping the major disciplines. And the third is an attempt to classify knowledge according to its objects. And these are just three examples to try and share with you what does go on. Classification of knowledge according to its distinctive forms and experience and the distinctive type of test it uses for its objective claims is an approach closely related to the one that we are really familiar with. Scholars use it in each of today's familiar disciplines. I've taken uh, a good deal of my uh, thinking from two British philosophers, Hurst and Peters. Uh, these two philosophers worked together and selected seven areas of knowledge which they claim are not reducible to another form. Now, philosophers will argue this, and I began by saying I don't pretend to be a philosopher. I do try to make sense out of what I have to do in education, and, and I found their, their thinking helpful. Um, the areas that they have identified are these. Number one, formal logic and mathematics. Number two, physical science. Number three, the human mind, including interpersonal experience and knowledge. Number four, moral judgment and awareness. Number five, aesthetic experience. Number six, religious experience. And number seven, philosophical understanding. It's likely intended to be in order of importance. Hurst and Peters have described each of these areas in terms of the concepts it encompasses and the tests used by scholars in that area to satisfy its claims of knowledge. For example, concepts in the physical sciences have to do with notions of space, time, and cause, while concepts in the area of interpersonal experience have to do with such notions as believing, deciding, intending, hoping, and enjoying. However, while each mode of knowledge is distinct, from any other form, there is a pattern of interrelationships among them. For example, the domain of science is dependent on mathematical knowledge, scientific discoveries lead to moral dilemmas, 
Some religious claims presuppose historical truths, others demand moral understanding. Hearst and Peters have argued that the development of knowledge and experience in any one domain may indeed be impossible without the understanding and awareness gained from another. And they summarize their argument as follows. I'd like to quote from them. It thus seems that the form of interrelationship between the independent domains of knowledge and experience can only be properly understood by recognizing first the basic differences between them and then by seeing how they are interlocked when one domain employs elements of another without any loss to the independent character of each. All of the classifications of knowledge according to disciplined domains depend on the employment of disciplined insight by the inquirer. Each discipline provides a different way of seeing the world. It sharpens the mind in advance so that insight is thought to come at the end of a process of experience in a certain field of study and not at the beginning. Michael Polanyi refers to this way of knowing as tacit knowledge and such perception as he describes the outcome of an active shaping of experience performed in the pursuit of knowledge. This shaping or integrating, he says, I hold to be the great and indispensable tacit power by which all knowledge is discovered and once discovered is held to be true. When Michael Polanyi um, put forward these ideas to the Royal Society in England, he uh, was the center of much controversy because it was such a contrast in the way of thinking that there could be something that was purely objective fact and truth, that you could have distance from any of us and any of the kinds of, of biases and prejudices or ways of thinking that we have. And Polanyi stood up and said to his colleagues, there isn't any way that we as human beings can divorce ourselves from our ways of knowing. Well, the controversy that he began certainly w raged for some time and probably is still uh, being waged in, in some circles, although more and more people have changed their ideas as we've uh, brought together more and more evidence of the truth of his, of his thinking. Since the attainment of real and valid knowledge depends on judgments made by people appropriate to the particular discipline, it should be stressed that the judge or authority upon which we can depend must have training and experience relevant to the problem at hand. We don't accept just anybody's judgment. Obviously, it has to be informed. The point I wish to make about the tacit knowledge that each person brings to the process of doing research or to the act of teaching or to the work of learning is a significant one. It requires conscious recognition by the proponents of a particular kind of knowledge and full understanding on the part of those who may be required to learn and to act upon that knowledge. It is well to remember the admonition, let the buyer beware, in the marketplace of ideas as well as in the marketplace of goods and services. It also emphasizes the limitations we impose on ourselves when we confine ourselves to perspectives on knowledge which do not take God into account. Jesus understood the thinking of the realistic Andrew and of the pragmatic Philip very well indeed when they were confronted with the problem of how to provide for an enormous crowd of hungry people. But he went beyond the materialistic and logical approaches they were dependent on to demonstrate that there are other ways of perceiving the same situation and other sets of presuppositions on which we can choose to base our actions. And I will return to this point later. Now, the second type of classification of knowledge, the one that we tend to use today, brings together major forms of disciplined knowledge into broader categories. A familiar example of this approach is the field of geography, which depends on knowledge organized around special objects, phenomena, or practices that are rooted in a variety of disciplines. Other examples are political studies, law, education, which encompass practical knowledge as well as moral elements. Still other examples are to be found in logical and philosophical studies based on the sciences of language and symbolism. A third illustration I wish to share with you of the way knowledge has been classified is one that distinguishes the different objects of knowledge, and I've taken this from the work of Elton Trueblood. He suggests that there are five ways of thinking about knowledge, 
One, the knowledge of bodies or of all those things that are susceptible to measurement. Two, the knowledge of other minds through communication and through consciously shared apprehension of some part of the environment. Three, knowledge of one's own mind achieved independently of the physical. Four, knowledge of values and universals or all of those objects of knowledge that cannot be measured, such as truth or beauty. And five, knowledge of God, the knowledge that deals with a mind capable of creating other bodies. Now, the uses of these or of any other schemes of classifying knowledge are intended to help us describe what counts for knowledge and what does not. Judgments about what is or what is not knowledge within disciplines and across disciplines vary according to the group of persons who select the criteria for knowledge deemed to be acceptable. Therein lies one of the persistent problems confronting us in institutions of post-secondary education. Much of the modern attitude toward knowledge is strongly influenced by the criteria for knowledge held to be appropriate in the physical and natural sciences. In its heyday, this approach to knowledge was adopted by some as a kind of benchmark against which all other forms of knowledge ought to be measured, including the area of religious knowledge. If claims to knowledge made in other fields of study could not meet the same tests used in the physical and natural sciences, they were found wanting, even though the tests were not appropriate to these other fields. Michael Polanyi's statement that I referred to earlier made mid-20th century, rejecting the ideal of scientific detachment in favor of an alternative idea of personal knowledge has led to uh, ongoing vigorous de debate. As a scientist himself, Polanyi had come to the point of realizing that every person pursuing knowledge actually participates in the act of understanding it and influences the way it is understood. In every act of knowing, he argued, there is a contribution by the person knowing what is being known. Polanyi insisted that this is not to be regarded as imperfection, but rather as a vital component of knowledge. A second notable change in the modern concept of what counts for knowledge has been a rejection of the notion that knowledge always grows incrementally, bit by bit. The idea that knowledge is expanded only by arriving at an explanation of a relatively small area and adding that bit to the main body of existing knowledge has not withstood the test of experience. Nor can it be said that knowledge is expanded primarily through the use of better and better instruments that enable us to see more objects or more of a single object or to see finer and finer components within objects. As Kuhn was able to demonstrate very effectively, the history of the growth of scientific knowledge is not based on the normal daily activities in the laboratory or in the field, as important as those are, but rather on the extraordinary moment when an individual or a team of scientists brings forth a completely new theory, an entirely different way of thinking about the problems that they are seeking to resolve, and rejects most of the assumptions commonly held up to that point. Kuhn observed that such knowledge comes about intermittently rather than in steady procession. The great turning points in thinking are not induced from facts, but are imaginative posits invented in one piece for application to nature, Kuhn says. When these insights become quickly recognized and adopted by other scientists, a whole new set of unquestioned assumptions and criteria for knowledge taken to be acceptable, and a whole new way of reasoning comes about. Thus it can be seen that the answer to the question, what is knowledge, is shaped both by the scholar or scholars providing the answer, and by the judgments of their colleagues who have attained disciplined insight and training in a particular field of study. It is clear that the outcomes of scientific inquiry have not been dictated by logic and experiment alone. There are social and psychological imperatives acting as well. Sociologists of knowledge have demonstrated how groups of people and agencies in any field of knowledge compete for cultural legitimacy. That being the case, one of the most important questions to be asked in education must always be, what knowledge is being excluded? Two sorts of replies can be expected. 
The first is that we certainly must deliberately exclude all claims to knowledge based on some form of unthinking behavioral response or on things which prevent people from understanding what they are doing. Propaganda, cultists, and so on, we would not want to count that for knowledge in terms of the way in which people have to respond to that sort of, of indoctrination. The second is that we are often wary in public situations, and I'm now speaking about a post-secondary education system which is public in nature, of opening up those forms of knowledge that may su subject core values and our own institutions to critical analysis. We're usually frightened of that. And because we're frightened of that, we exclude it from the curriculum. For example, relatively little emphasis has been placed on social and moral forms of knowledge in many public institutions of post-secondary education because it is more difficult to present arguments in these fields based on intellectually controlled inquiry than it is in the natural sciences, for example. But it is also more difficult because it does challenge religious and cultural views. Nevertheless, a challenge to the almost exclusive notion of valid knowledge as science or a science-based technology is now being voiced more and more urgently in the light of the evidence of human behavior and the consequences to be seen in business and government and other sectors of society when ethical and moral standards are set aside and ignored. The importance of scholarship in aesthetic, religious, and moral forms of knowledge is being more broadly recognized, I think, along with the wide re recognition customarily accorded to the symbolics of mathematics and the empirics of the physical sciences. The contemporary concept of knowledge can be said to be characterized by a new humility that grows out of a greater awareness that error is possible in any of the forms of knowledge and a greater awareness that scholars must assume some responsibility for the uses made of the knowledge they generate through their research and their creative thinking. And that represents a revolution in our day, I believe. Bernofsky, writing in uh, 1973, said, as a scientist, we are always at the brink of the known. We always feel forward to what is hoped. Every judgment stands on the edge of error and is personal. The recognition of the personal dimension in all knowledge is well understood by all who've experienced what is commonly described as religious conversion. This experience brings an entirely new understanding about ourselves, about our relationship with others, and above all, about our relationship with God, because it enables us to see things in an entirely new way. It gives us a different conceptual framework. Our perspective changes, sometimes quite suddenly, and sometimes more gradually. This new way of seeing things in relation to God, this new knowledge is indeed a revelation to us, and it is a revelation that has been the experience of human beings throughout the course of history. It is the kind of knowledge that meets the three conditions demanded when assessing any claim to knowledge. First, it begins with a belief or a hypothesis about a God who is a creator and a sustainer of all life. Second, such knowledge is justified on the evidence recorded in the history of human experience on its power to explain phenomena that cannot adequately be explained otherwise. And thirdly, the Christian's claim, if it is a Christian in this instance, claim for truth of knowledge gained through revelation has reliably been found to be the case by individuals and nations who have acted in accordance with the knowledge gained through biblical revelation and their understanding of God's revelation of himself. To summarize, I suggested at the beginning of today's lecture that I believe it is essential to the mission of the Christian Church that it assume an active role in post-secondary education for at least three important reasons. One, we ought to be able to communicate the truth as we know it in language that can be understood by our contemporaries. Second, we should be able to demonstrate how that truth not only fulfills the criteria established by reason alone, but also transcends those intellectual boundaries. And third, we should be able to add qualitatively to the body of knowledge by bringing a Christian perspective to scholarship in every field of study. I have touched on the fact that contemporary concepts 
about what counts for knowledge have been changing. Earlier in this century, the ideas put forward by the Vienna Circle, known as logical positivism, powerfully affected the ways in which the search for knowledge has been conducted in almost every field of inquiry. The positivists contended that only the knowledge gained through accurate observation and based on so-called independent fact could be deemed to be valid and reliable. By mid-century, as I pointed out, the voices of the critics of the positivist claim were becoming stronger. The philosopher Wittgenstein and others like him argued that the concepts we bring to bear on what we see and experience actually shape what we see and how we see. Now, I'm a bird watcher, and I would have to tell you that that is exactly what happens to us as bird watchers. And if any of you in the audience today know uh, what it means to be out in the field, you have uh, a way of approaching uh, knowledge about what you are seeing that is shaped, pre-shaped, by your study of the field guides, by your experience of seeing birds of similar species in similar conditions and habitats. And sometimes when you're looking for a very rare species, you're hard put to be very sure that what you're seeing is actually there and not that you're seeing something because you so very much want to see a particular eye ring or a stripe or a color to identify a fairly rare species. Uh, and, and so I use that as a very down-to-earth, very day-to-day -day kind of, of experience. I mean, when I came back to campus, uh, at noontime today, I had the thrilling experience, because I, I am a bird watcher, of seeing a gorgeous bald eagle flying here at the Gaspro just as I turned off the main, the main highway. There was no mistaking that, that scintillating, beautiful white head of the bald eagle. Uh, it wasn't hard for me as a bird watcher to say just like that, oh, there's a bald eagle. But I'm in the field lots of times when I see a bird, I have no idea what I'm looking at, and I have to bring a whole way of knowing to that experience. Now, if you're a bird watcher, you may have heard the term gissing. Maybe you don't use it in this part of Canada, but it stands G-I-S-S -S, for general impression of size and shape. So one of the things when you see something unknown is to try and get that general impression. And so you engage in gissing. You say that bird, you know, what, what the the habitat is, um, it's got long legs or short legs, is it near the water, is it up in a tree? You just get this general impression and by doing so you start narrowing down a good deal. Of, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, literally hundreds of other species, you're going to have to focus in on something fairly, fairly narrow. But that won't do. I mean, I may want to know that it is a, wor a wader or a, a duck or, a, or something like that or a warbler, but I want to know more about it than that. So I have to do something much more specific than the general impression of size and shape, and I have to start thinking of ways to entice that bird out of hiding, perhaps, or to get closer, and I may use a telescope or my binoculars. On the other hand, I may use what some bird watchers call fishing. Now, I haven't really gone off the deep end. You make little sounds like shh, shh, shh. And believe it or not, birds are attracted by that, and little birds will come out from under leaves or hop down on on boughs in order to come closer to you to see who you are. And when that happens, you can get a much better look and you can be much more accurate because you're now focusing in on that one particular bird and looking at its particular characteristics. Now sometimes you're able to understand what you see because you have enough background knowledge. Sometimes I have to go home and look up the bird guide or consult somebody else. And sometimes when I consult all those authorities, I still can't find the answer. In fact, if you're watching skeins of geese, perhaps coming on to fall now, you may take a look at some very odd behavior where uh, a string of birds will be flying across the sky and all of a sudden someone in that, that one of those geese will start sort of uh, side slipping and turn over and fly on its back or do something really quite strange. You might see ravens and crows doing that similar things across the field. Uh, nobody knows entirely why they engage in that behavior. It's not courtship display, seemingly. Um, and so we bird watchers have a great name for it. It's called whistling, when you don't know well or whiffling, right? 
Sometimes we have to do that. Later on, further study and scientific study may tell us what it is that's going on, and we can then explain it, and we won't use that kind of excuse term, whiffling. I would argue that in the field of knowledge, and as, as uh, esoteric as some of our fields of knowledge are, that that's generally the way in which we start approaching the unknown. We have these general ways of focusing in closer and closer to try and understand what it is we are looking at or trying to understand or come closer to or explain. So we, we ourselves, bring something to that experience that, and it shapes how and what we are seeing. And a, a, an experiment that's going on in the lab can never be totally structured by theory, but will be at least in part pre-structured by the researcher's own conceptual framework. And if there are some of you grad students in the room, I'm sure you're struggling through that idea as you try and get closer and closer to identifying your research questions and conducting your research and writing theses. Acknowledgement of this human reality on the part of the scientific community gradually has become much more widespread, forcing the recognition that there is no domain of morally neutral fact. In the Venice Declaration of 1986, uh, this is at least 60 years later than the original Vienna Circle uh, was um, so dominant, the assembled scientists there, convened by, in fact, UNESCO, stated that the world crisis brought about by the dangers to human life and survival resulting from scientific discoveries, and I quote here from their declaration, throw a new light on the social responsibilities of the scientific community, both in the initiation and in the application of research. Although scientists may have no control over the application of their own discoveries, they must not remain passive when confronted with the haphazard use of what they have discovered. Nor can the church remain passive. When physicists, philosophers, sociologists, economists, economists, educators, and other scholars from around the world met in Toronto in 1987 to focus on the question, what is the meaning of life? And one of the economists chose to address that symposium on the topic, what is of ultimate importance? It was starkly apparent to me, at least, that there has been resurgence of interest in the kinds of questions that Christianity has always been meant to address. That particular conference was convened by an association known as the International Society for the Study of Human Ideas on Ultimate Reality and Meaning, or URAM for short, according to a report in the Global Mail. And their headline in the paper read, Human Race Ill-Served by Ill-Equipped decision makers group toll. Ironically, that headline succinctly summarizes the message that the church has been trying to make clear for centuries, along with the message that there is a way to be sure that the human race is well served by well equipped decision makers. That way has provided has been provided by one who offered himself as the way, the truth, and the life. The role of the church since its inception has been to lead people to that way. One of the means of doing so requires the capacity to disseminate knowledge about reality and about God's ultimate purposes in a manner that can be understood and believed by scholars and researchers in institutions of post-secondary education and by the graduates of those institutions. How the church can fulfill this role through its members individually and institutionally are the subjects I intend to address in the two remaining lectures in this series. Thank you.